there was a moment in the preseason where I was talking about practice and I was talking about what we were hearing from practice. Now, obviously, it was a situation like none we have ever experienced. No one was allowed to be at practice. Even reporters who are normally given like five minutes, 10 minutes press availability before practice to observe, they weren't even allowed out there. So there was very little tangible, legitimate information coming out of practices. So uh, I was hearing from Alabama that they thought their offense was going to be better this year. Pause and think about what I just said. Now it sounds reasonable. Back then it sounded ludicrous. What I was telling you was not firsthand. I was telling you someone with firsthand knowledge of the Alabama program is suggesting that replacing Tua Tungabailoa with Matt Jones and taking Jerry Judy and Henry Ruggs away from this offense and Jedrick Wills and taking away stud after stud from this offense, it's still going to be better than it was last year. Not as good. They think it's going to be better. And it happened. It actually happened. Like, I, I'm a believer in that. At the very least, it's on par. I think this offense is better than the one they had last year. And now they've lost Waddle. And it still looks better than the one they had last year. I don't know how in the world you do that. I can tell you one reason, and it's the guy who just won the Broyles Award, and that's Steve Sarkeesian. You just got to pay the man his money. That's what you got to do. And trust me, they have and they will. You just got to pay the man his money. So a uh, strong tip of the cap to that upstart program out of Tuscaloosa, uh, the University of, who is it, Colin? Alabama. Yeah, I think they're called Alabama. Um, they, they have an, an intangible mascot name, Crimson Tide. And then there's an elephant on the sideline. But I want you to think about this for a second. Let's rewind 10 years. 11 years, 12 years. So let's say Saban just got to Alabama. They're just beginning their run. It's, it's 2008, 2009, that time frame. If I were to tell you, even back then, if I were to tell you, hey, headline, Alabama has six first-team All-Americans, you'd say, well, that makes sense. I mean, it's a good program, up-and-coming program. They're right near the top every year now. They're recruiting well. I could see that. And then I said, no, 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 no. You don't get it. I'm from the future. I'm from 2020. And I'm telling you, even then, the Saban guy is still going to be there. So take the over, first piece of advice. Secondly, I am informing you, they're going to have six first-team All-Americans that year. Uh, here's the catch. Only one of them is going to be on defense. At the time, mind you, this is the John Parker Wilson, Greg McElroy era. The A.J. McCarron era is still to come at Alabama. And I'm telling you, sure as I'm standing here, a uh, future version of myself, that a decade from now, you're still going to be winning titles. You're still going to be right there at the front of the college football world every year, except that when you're racking up half a dozen first-team All-Americans a decade from now, all but one of them is going to be on offense. I don't know what I would think about that, to be honest with you. I don't know. Unless everything is going complete service academy and everyone's going to run the ball 90% of the time and just it may be Alabama running backs and fullbacks and offensive linemen winning the award. That's what I would think. But... That's not the way it's happened, is it? So obviously, it's been talked about at this point. Nick Saban has evolved his program. But now we're looking ahead to the playoff. And I thought that was a really good article that uh, Bud Elliott put on 247sports.com. I think it's still on the front page. At least it is at the time that I am recording this. And again, we're having to record a little bit early because, you know, a bomb went off in Nashville and we have no internet downtown where I live. So I'm still down in Georgia. But Bud was talking about the value of the number one seed. So Alabama's got the number one seed in the playoff. And I've heard some people throwing around the stat that the number one seed has only won the college football playoff national championship one time. And it really doesn't mean anything. It's, it's much too small of a sample size. And the number one seed in the playoff does not always equate to the team that you would power rate number one. You know, like to go back to that 2012 game, it was pre-playoff. But even if there was a playoff committee that year, Notre Dame would have been the number one seed. Alabama would not have been the number one seed, yet Alabama was favored by 10 points on the field against Notre Dame and ended up beating them 42-14. to 14. So did the number one seed truly indicate who the number one team that year was? No, in power rating style. So that doesn't always mean everything, but it does this year because the true number one team is also number one in the playoff. Now, it's very typical. Obviously, if you've made the playoff, you're a good team. Notre Dame's a good team. They are yet a 20-point underdog against Alabama. And if that seems high, I'm reading right off the screen right now. This is Bud's words, not mine. If that seems high, it's because it is. The record, by the way, for any round of the college football playoff as a betting favorite was 14 and a half points. And that was not that long ago. It was 2018. It was Alabama versus Oklahoma. That was at the Orange Bowl. 
I was there. I am, as of the time of this recording, actually wearing the Orange Bowl pullover that I got from the fine folks at the Orange Bowl. And I'm not bragging. It's actually a sad commentary on my life that outside of the white t-shirts you see me wear, pretty much the only time I ever get new clothes is when a bowl game gives me new clothes. So I rely on the bowl games more than you could possibly know. In fact, if you guys could do me one favor and some of the games out there coordinate with the other games and start handing out jeans or maybe the occasional pair of shoes, sandals, I don't care. A khakis, need a nice pair of khakis. You know, in case I need to ever go apply for a loan, for example, I'd like to have a nice pair of khakis. I can borrow the dress shoes from my uncle, so we're good there. But here's the interesting stat, getting back to the actual topic at hand. Here's the interesting stat. This is kind of what I was talking about, and Bud pointed it out numerically here. The typical gap between number one and number four has not been very big. And when I say gap, I mean point spread gap. So we're talking about the college football playoff. It's been around since 2014. If I were to ask you off the top of your head, guess the average point spread, number one favored over number four by how much on average? Would you be surprised to know that the answer is less than a touchdown? Number one has been favored over number four by an average of just 6.7 points. What's that a result of? Well, it's a result of the fact that, as I said, the number one ranked team is not always the number one power rated team. Sometimes you'll have a team like Alabama a couple of times, actually, that has stumbled in the regular season and then gets in the playoff and ends up you know, being the highest rated team in the playoff, according to Vegas, but the number four team, according to the College Football Playoff Committee. So the rankings aren't always everything um, in terms of power rating. Now, here is where it gets truly interesting, and it's probably where you want to cut it off if you're a Notre Dame fan. It's possible to pull these upsets. It's not impossible. It's improbable, but it may not be impossible. But here's the problem. Here's why I was talking about the Alabama from a generation ago, 10 years ago, versus the Alabama from now. It's extremely hard to upset this team now if you don't have potency at quarterback. You can do it if you've got potency at quarterback. Like Kyle Trask in Florida, they were a anywhere from a 14 to a 17-point underdog, depending on when you bet the game. But yet... They were there in the fourth quarter within one possession against Alabama last week. Like if they recovered an onside kick, they would have had a chance to go win the game. So that's how close they were. You can decide how close that is, but that's how close they were. Notre Dame, it's really unlikely to find themselves in that position because there is a certain level of firepower, a certain level of what I just call answerability you have to have offensively or else you are completely rudderless. You have no hope against this team. It's kind of like... If you know you're faster than someone and you're racing them on the playground, you, you can afford to turn around and run backwards and thumb your nose at them, knowing all the while that no matter how close they get to you, the second you turn around, you got 38% more speed than they do at your top end. And unless you trip or unless you pull something, you're going to pull away from them. Alabama knows that. I'm not telling you they ever thumb their nose at someone. I'm just saying when you're watching those games, even when you were watching Alabama-Florida last week, Florida's within one possession late. So they're there. They're in the game the whole time. Did you ever feel like Alabama was going to lose? You didn't because you never felt like Florida was going to stop them. And even if Notre Dame gets a couple of more stops, they've got the entire opposite problem. They don't have the ability to trade points every time. And it's kind of like this, this funnel that I'm looking at right here that I used to cut my protein powder with, sometimes pouring it into a turkey shake, by the way. It's at the very base of the funnel. It's very compact, obviously. And about a millimeter or two up, it's still very compact. But then all of a sudden, as a funnel does, it rapidly fans out. And that's kind of what Alabama does. It rapidly fans out. When it comes to margin of victory against you, if you can trade points with them, so if you're at the base of the funnel, in other words, and you have the ability to trade points, you can beat them. Like Clemson could beat them. Ohio State theoretically could beat them. They wouldn't be favored, but they could beat them. Florida had a shot to hang with them because Florida could trade points. I'd be really interested, and I don't know what it would look like, but I'd be interested to see North Carolina play them. Like Ole Miss played them close. Maybe North Carolina could play them close. These are teams that have the ability to trade points. But just like the bottom inch or so of that funnel is very compact, very rapidly it spreads out. And that's what the margin, potentially, of victory for Alabama does against teams like Notre Dame when they don't have the offensive firepower. So Bud's talking about it in this piece. And again, it's on 247sports.com, and I would encourage you to go read it. And what he's doing is he's essentially taking comparative numbers, and he is taking the point spread for Alabama-Notre Dame, and then he's taking prior point spreads like Clemson-Notre Dame, or theoretically, what would Ohio State be against Notre Dame? And what those numbers say is... 
theoretically, again, if everything's just equal, if Alabama's favored by 20 over Notre Dame, then Alabama should be favored by 10 or 11 over Clemson, right? Well, that's not right. Mathematically, it's right if you're believing everything's equal, but it's not. Because here's what the odds makers are going to tell you. If Alabama and Clemson both win Saturday or Friday, they will play in a national championship game, and Alabama will be favored, but it will not be by double digits. And in fact, it will probably not be by over a touchdown. They'll be favored, but it'll be closer. And so you'll look at the relative data, and you'll say, wait a second. If Alabama was favored by this over Notre Dame, and Clemson was favored by this over Notre Dame, like shouldn't, be, shouldn't Alabama then be favored by this number over Clemson? No, because Clemson has something in the eyes of an odds maker and you and I that Notre Dame doesn't have, and that is answerability. That is point trading potential. And so we're going the opposite way in the funnel. We're going from the top now down to the bottom. And once you get from two inches high in the funnel to one inch high in the funnel, there's a huge difference. It goes from being really spread out to really compact. And that's the margin potential. In an Alabama-Clemson matchup, the margin potential is really tight. Clemson can beat them. No one's really looking at Notre Dame thinking they have a shot to beat Alabama because no one thinks they can answer Alabama. They think they can give a nice, solid, fist-in-the-air effort. They think they can do that. But folks think that Clemson could actually upset Alabama. They don't think Notre Dame can upset them. And I got to be honest with you, I agree with that mentality.